afternoon, everyone. Um, as Andrew mentioned, um, I have quite a lot of interest in community and user engagement. I believe that there is little point in painstakingly managing records and accumulating warehouses or servers full of archives if no one knows about them or if they're inaccessible or impenetrable. Am I too loud? Is that alright? Um, my view is that we should always have use in mind when creating and describing records and that our role must include strategies to help our current audiences and reach out to potential ones. Community engagement should also involve partnering with the community to ensure their priorities and values shape our services and systems. So I was quite happy today when I got invited along to speak about our community engagement strategies. And I'm going to be concentrating on three key projects at the City of Sydney. Now, these are not the only ones, um, but I think that they're an, a pretty impressive representative selection, and I hope you agree. So these, the three projects that I have chosen fall nicely into the categories of past, present and future. So we have in the past the exhibition that we held for the 175th anniversary of the city in 2017. The present is the Hoardings Project, which is currently underway. And the future is the project to implement a new archives management system, which is to be launched next year. Um, that is very cryptically called Campus on the slide. I'll explain that a bit later. Now, as much as I would love to take credit for all three of these projects, I've only been the City Archivist since August of last year. So these initiatives were all established by my predecessors. In particular, I'd like to acknowledge Mark Stevens and Michael Smith, who were the two last uh, City Archivists, uh, and they provided leadership and vision on these projects. Michael's now my manager. He took on the role of Manager of Information Management in 2018, so he's still heavily involved in some of these projects. And many other people also contributed to these initiatives, and I'll mention some of those people as we look at each one. But first, I'll give you a bit of background. So the City of Sydney is the second oldest council in Australia and has a, a sta a, sorry, existed as a municipality since 1842. If you're interested, we were picked at the post by Adelaide in 1841. The boundaries have changed over the years quite a lot, um, but the local government area currently consists of about 27 square kilometres. We follow the harbour shore, foreshore from Rushcutters Bay to Glebe. We go as far as Annandale in the west, Sydney Park and Rosebury in the south, and Centennial Park and Paddington in the east. The city does not transfer its archives to Sarah. We have our own archives, which was officially established in 1976. And I manage a team of six and 33 volunteers. We have approximately 12,000 shelf metres of archives, along with about 5,500 shelf metres of semi-active records. And all of them are stored off-site at the Government Records Repository at Kingswood. Now, at the city, we actually have three different types of archives. We keep state archives, so they're permanent records under local, uh, of the council under General Retention and Disposal Authority 39 for local government. We also keep city archives, and they're records which may not be permanent under GA 39, but which are deemed by the city archivist, currently me, uh, to have importance to the local community. And we also have community archives because we're a collecting institution. So we acquire um, information mainly regarding the Sydney local government area, um, which can support and enhance our collection. For example, we partner with some community organisations such as the Sydney Festival and the Glebe Society, and we manage their archives on their behalf. Now, the city is very committed to open and transparent access to information that we hold in trust for the community. And we've always had quite a lot of public interest in our records. We have a, the tower behind Town Hall is where a lot of our staff are. And on level 21 of that tower, we 
have a search room, which is traditionally where the public and users and internal staff have come to research our records in hard copy formats. They're retrieved from the Government Records Repository for use there. And that used to be the key way that people got access to our collection. But over the years that that has dropped off and now we only get about a thousand um, people visiting the search room each year. The city also receives about 5,000 written requests for information per year. Uh, and they're handled either by our information access team or by our archives team, depending on what exact, exactly has been requested. Our most heavily requested series are development and building applications and also images from our extensive collection of photographs of Sydney. Now, I did say that I'd focus on three key <coughs> initiatives today, but I thought it's useful to give you a little bit of um, information about the foundational ways we've made our collection available to the public. From early days, we have been trying to make our heavily used information available online. So we have over 80,000 photographs available online through our photographic website, which is called Archive Pics. And that receives about 550,000 hits a year. And those photographs are also available through Trove. We also manage a digitisation program and have for a number of years. And we focus on digitising our most highly used and valuable records. So recently, for example, we've just, just about finishing digitising uh, development applications from 1997 through to 2016. And 2016 is the year that uh, planning went fully digital. So as I mentioned before, they're highly requested records, so it's really good to have digital copies of them. We also have a volunteer program. As I mentioned, we've got 33 volunteers currently, and they're engaged in creating or enhancing our item-level metadata for our collection. And they're the most incredible bunch of people aged between uh, about 22, right up to in mid-80s somewhere, and uh, they uh, make our collection far more accessible than we could ever manage by ourselves. So that's a bit of background about the city, and now I'm going to go and have a look at these three key strategies. <coughs> so the past project I want to talk about is the 175th anniversary of the city, of the incorporation of the city, which was in 2017. Now, anniversaries are always a really great opportunity to celebrate an organisation and the people in it and to look back on past achievements. Anniversaries that are connected with the locality mean that there's also a special community connection because if you live or you work in that locality or you have in the past or if your family are connected with that locality, then there is personal relevance to you. So when the 175th anniversary was approaching, the city historian, Lisa Murray, the curator of the civic collection, Margaret Betteridge, and the then city archivist, Michael Smith, um, just, uh, looked at, they looked at a lot of different options, but after the discussion with management, they decided to share the celebrations with the community via an exhibition and associated public program. So the exhibition was called Our City, 175 years in 175 objects. Out of interest, did anybody go to this exhibition? Anybody see it? One person, oh dear. <laughs> okay, it was really good. Uh, it, it was probably the biggest undertaking that we'd done in many years and it required close to two years of planning. Uh, it was coordinated by the three team leaders I've already mentioned and their teams, um, but there was involvement from many parts of council. The aims of the exhibition were to showcase and raise awareness about the collections, to engage with the community by promoting history and heritage, and to show the impact of council itself as administrators of the city over 175 years, including their visionary leadership and major achievements in the growth and development of the city and in the shaping of the communities. Now what all that means is it was a celebration, but it was also a promotional tool uh, for the collections and also for the city. The exhibition had four key themes. 
governing, working, building and inspiring. And within each of those themes, there was a range of sub-themes or topics, as lofty as the Meralty and as lowly as toilets, sewers and vermin. And you wouldn't believe how much interest they get. Entry was free and the exhibition ran for over two weeks in late October to early November 2017. And it was held in the lower town hall. Uh, I don't know if you've ever been there, but it's quite an extensive space under the town hall. Public programs included a late night mystery objects event, a number of floor talks by city staff, and the commissioning of a contemporary musical work for the grand organ. And there were performances associated with that, including a free concert as part of Sydney Open. A colour catalogue was produced, and I have a copy of mine if anybody wants to have a look at this later. Um, and it can still be purchased at Abbey's Bookshop. Now, while we had 175 key objects in the exhibition and highlighted in the catalogue, there were actually about 400 objects in the exhibition altogether. And they included archives, furniture, banners, ephemera, clothing, audiovisual material, models, and more. We did a large call out to schools and historical societies and other places for volunteers to help us to monitor and interact with visitors during the exhibition. Uh, and Susan Kennedy and I coordinated 63 volunteers who did four hour shifts. Some volunteers did multiple shifts or they didn't want to go home at the end of their shifts. And a number of volunteers um, from the exhibition ended up as part of our regular volunteer program. So did we engage with the community with this event? Well, I think the answer is a resounding yes. We received over 7,000 visitors across 17 days and daily attendance increased during the exhibition period as we got, got out. We actually had queues of people waiting for the doors to open by the second week. Um, many visitors spent several hours in the exhibition and a lot of people actually came back more than once. The tie-in with Sydney Open, I think, also brought in quite a lot of visitors. So we had things like families and groups wandering around where the older ones were sharing stories with the younger people. And the content covered so many areas of council activity that there really was something for everyone. Um, you can see on the slide here a few comments from our visitors book. So we had a visitors book out within the exhibition space for people to sign. And that's been a lovely lasting memory of years of the exhibition um, and you can see some statistics there on our success. It actually was uh, well in excess of any visibility that the collections had ever received before. The value of coverage through print, television and radio and that's excluding online content was estimated at $750,000 and we had a cumulative audience reach of $4.5 million. The Lord Mayor was thrilled. She actually visited the exhibition many, many times. And on the slide you, at the bottom on the right there, you can see the comment that she made in the minute of the 11th of December 2017. I want to thank our council predecessors for their stewardship of our city and the foresight and dedication in maintaining the records and archives which made the exhibition possible. We also received highly commended at the National Trust Awards in 2018. So I'm sorry you missed it. <laughs> um, the present project that I want to explore today is the Hoardings Project. Now, in case you don't know, hoardings are temporary boards erected around a building site during construction or renovation. So the Hoardings Project at the city commenced in January of 2014, and it required the use of historical images on the hoardings of heritage building developments in our local government area. Now, I'm sure that you've seen these, <laughs> because they're all over the city now. So I'm sure if you walk around, you'll see them. It was the brainchild of managers of the construction and building team after seeing artworks and images being used on hoardings in Europe. And it formed part of the Creative Cities Cultural Policy and Action Plan adopted by council in 2013-14. And the city archives has been integral to this project from the beginning. So our role has been to select high quality historical images and related themes for use on the hoardings, to plan and construct a historic images web page, which went live in 2016, 
and to deliver the image files to applicants. And before that web page went live in 2016, we were also doing ad hoc um, delivery of images to, uh, to applicants. So there are many people involved in this project as well, but I'd like to particularly recognise the contribution of Peter Conroy from Construction and Building, who instigated and drives the project, the Cultural Projects team, who oversee the project, and Ben Arnfield, who is one of the archivists in my team. And he's very interested in photography and was very passionate and dedicated to the development of this project. So the historic images hoarding page is on the city's website, and I've got the link there if you're interested. When an applicant goes to that web page, they find a hoardings design template and guidelines, and they can choose images from pre-selected and curated themes and obtain the mandatory citations that go along with each image. And then the applicant contacts the city archives, who provide them with a high-resolution image file. So the use of the template and the images is free of charge. Now, in the future, we're planning to add more images to existing themes and areas and also add new themes and areas within the wider local government area. And that is to ensure that images aren't, don't get overused and the project and approach continues to be fresh and interesting for members of the public. So in terms of community engagement, the Hoardings Project has been a huge winner. People love to see these images around the city. It's like an outdoor photographic gallery and it connects people with place and with the past. It makes something that is quite ugly, the building site, into something to enjoy and appreciate. And the city has even uh, reported a reduction in vandalism since we put these images up. It's raised the profile of the archives dramatically and has led to many requests not only for those images but also in the collection in general and the goodwill that it's generated is really unmeasurable. I just want to finish by, uh, talking about the hoardings by sharing with you this particular story, which some of you may have seen before, about this, this image. Um, so this is Woolloomooloo's Ch Woolloomooloo Children's Playground in 1951, and it was on a hoarding in Woolloomooloo. And a resident was walking past this picture, her name was Sandra Gennato, and she recognised the boy playing. It was her husband as a child. So she wrote uh, to her local MP, who then contacted the Lord Mayor, who put her in touch with us, and we gave her a copy of this image, and she supplied us with a lot more metadata about where the image was taken. So that's a lovely personal connection. Okay, we're down to one more to go. So this is uh, the future project that I want to talk to you today is our project to implement a new archives management uh, system at the city. So I did tell you that I would explain what campus means. Um, campus stands for City Archives Management and Public Access System. It's not the name of the system, it's the name of the project. So it's a useful acronym for us to be walking around and bristling our staff with but it won't really mean anything to the public. Um, so the system consists of three components. There's an archives management system to help us manage our processes and metadata about the collection and to manage both scanned and bought digital images, uh, digital objects, I mean. It's, there's also a digital preservation tool to manage the integrity of the digital objects. And the third part is a user portal to allow the public to access the collection and to self-serve. Um, the campus project was conceived about three years ago out of necessity. For the previous 20 years or so, we've been using a system called BOS, a business operating system, with a front end called Archives Investigator. Now, I'm presuming that some of you are familiar with Archives Investigator at least. Uh, it was developed in liaison with State Archives and Records Authority and, uh, and they had also been using it until recently. So while it was good for its time, BOSS has not met our needs for many years and it had limited ability to store and add metadata and it's been suppl supplemented a great deal over time. So we've added a database here, a little while later another database, some spreadsheets, some more spreadsheets and by 2015, we had our archival collection spread across 13 different systems. 
BOSS also did not allow the storage of digital objects and those systems that we had that did allow the storage of digital objects did not have digital preservation functionality. Archives Investigator, the front end, was also not meeting our needs. A research survey of users in 2015 told us that users found it difficult to understand and most simply avoided it. On top of those issues, a few of the systems, including BOS and our photographic database archive picks, were no longer supported. So that was posing a risk to our collection. And while all that was happening, we were also struggling to meet our 5,000 requests, written requests for information a year. So because we had information spread across so many different systems, and some of those systems were inaccessible to the public, what that meant was that the archivist always had to be the mediator between um, the information and the users. And so it was really labour intensive and it was getting more so. So then we decided that what we needed to do was to amalgamate as much archival information as we could into the one system and make that easy for the public to use. We also needed to be able to display our digital objects and make them downloadable to encourage users to self-serve and reduce our request load. So I joined the project in 2016 uh, in my then role as information analyst and we embarked on a concept development phase. Now this phase took about a year and a half and it involved Firstly, developing a business case to obtain executive approval and funding for the project. Then we created a data model, requirements and metadata specification based on the Australian series system of archival control and about a gazillion um, metadata standards out there. And uh, I want to show you the data model. I'm not going to explain it because it's hideous, but just to show you the kind of complexity we're talking about, that is our data model. All those lines, coloured lines going in different directions are actually relationships between the entities within the boxes. We also came up with nearly a thousand requirements for our system. Now we thought we were very clever doing that at the time, you know, we, we're going to make sure we uh, dot all our I's and cross our T's so these vendors don't take advantage of us. But then we had to go to tender. So we had to submit our poor tenderers to answering 1,000 requirements each, and then we had to go and assess against 1,000 requirements. So that was a pretty horrendous project, and I think one of the things we learned, if we're going to be listing lessons learned, will be don't do so many requirements. Um, anyway, by the end of that, we decided on a product called Recollect, by New Zealand Micrographic Services, or NZMS. So Recollect uh, uh, could not meet all of our many requirements. Um, no product could. But what attracted us to them was their extremely user-friendly interface. So the basis of their system was user-centred design. And the users, in this case, were not the archivists, they were members of the public. Uh, NZMS were also very customer focused and willing to grow their product in the ways we needed it to grow. So we started implementation with them in June of last year and we expect that most of our development will be completed by the end of the year. We plan to soft launch the product in December and formally in late March 2020. Now I mentioned user-centred design. Prior to the, pro uh, the project, we collect collected information about users of the collection through a user survey we did in 2015 and an analysis of our information access requests in 2017. Throughout our project, we're employing user-centred design strategies. So every decision that we make is with a user lens. We're asking questions like, is this going to give users what they want? Will they understand intuitively how to do this? How can we improve the user experience? And how can we encourage them to engage with us? 
And if a choice has to be made between an archivist and a user and their needs, we will always choose the user. We're already testing the system with staff, but when the user interface is more advanced, we're planning to do testing with our other current audiences, including volunteers, staff that are involved with the hoardings, the Professional Historians Association, the Society of Australian Genealogists, and others, and we'll learn more about their experiences and incorporate their feedback in order to make more improvements. We also have the ability within the system to measure user engagement. So we'll be tracking user engagement all the way through and if we need to tweak things here and there, then we will continue to do so. So, um, the solution is with AWS in cloud and it has the ability to store and add unlimited metadata. The more metadata available, the more ways items in the collection can be found and um, by current and potential users. And I've got a slide here to show you an example of our metadata. So what's in the black is what we have in Bob's, and what's in the blue is what we will have in Recollect. The solution has the ability to store digital objects, and we're working with New Zealand Micrographic Services to build in digital preservation functionality and the ability to manage archival processes. Uh, it also has the ability to display archival relationships as per that extremely complex data model that I showed you before. So I can't show you the whole product because we haven't finished it. In fact, we haven't done a lot on the UI yet, but um, I've got a brief list of some of the user-centric features. So it does give us direct access, but it does give the public direct access to metadata and digital objects we hold without the need for going through a, a, an archivist. Now, I said I can't show you the UI, but I'm going to give you a little sneak peek. Um, but this is a prototype only, so don't go looking at it too closely. <laughs> We're not going to have uh, beautiful photographs of flowers here, for example. That will actually be the collections that are on those tiles. And up the top, I notice we've got uh, in the taxonomy list, we've got Andrew's and Denise's taxonomy field. That, that's going to go. <laughs> um, but uh, what you can see from here is we've got a search bar in the, in the smack bang in the middle where users can do keyword searching. Uh, they, there is also an advanced search in the system where they can do a keyword search and then filter by various means. Uh, or they can do browsing. So those collection tiles with the pretty flowers are there opportunities to go into different parts of the collection and browse around curated uh, areas or areas where we've got customised searching. And they're really going to be our most highly used areas. Um, there's also going to be custom entry pages for some users, for example, the hoardings users. So people with a particular need. Um, we will also have the opportunity to browse by map. This is very exciting for me. So our user studies showed us that many of our users are looking for location information. So the new system has this ability to browse by map. So that um, the map on this page is actually just a static image, but if you click on it, you can go into an interactive map. You can um, keep go um, going into, zooming in, until you get to the area you want. And if there's one of these little red tags, click on it and it will tell you all the images that we have, or sorry, all the digital objects that we have associated with that and will provide you links to them. Pretty impressive, huh? Um, now, obviously, we're going to need to build up our geo location, uh, geo coordinates in our metadata in order to get the sort of value that we need out of this feature. We've got about 10,000 images so far tagged with geolocation um, information, but we've got a lot more to go, so we're going to put our volunteers onto those projects. Um, users will generally be led to items, so contextual information like series and functions uh, are going to be available within the system through it to explore through links, but they won't need to understand context in order to get to the information that they want. 
Users will also have the ability to save searches, share information via social media, like particular records, and tag items with additional information. So all those sorts of modern features that people expect on systems now. The system even has the ability for us to manage online volunteers or to set up subsites for online contributors to administer. We're also able to establish and maintain online exhibitions. So if we have another big exhibition like 175th, which none of you got to see, you could go to our site and get access to it there. Um, it also allows narrative text. So we've got a, uh, two people who make up a history team at the city. So they're going to bring a lot of their historic content over into the site and we can display it. We can also link it. Um, so if they're dis um, their content, for example, has some images from our collection, you'll be able to click on the image and go straight through to the metadata about that image. It also allows us to display photographs, which is quite a nifty feature, where you can see the front of the photographic album and you can actually open and see the pages as they were. And you can also zoom into particular images and see the metadata about those images. As the city also has our civic collection, which includes artworks and objects, furniture, things like that. Um, if we add metadata for those, we can link the objects to the archival information we have that relates to them. And the system is also discoverable by Google and Trove. Are we going to achieve community engagement with this initiative? Uh, it's yet to be seen, but we are certainly working as hard as we can to make it so. So we will have public access to all the available metadata and digital objects in our collection, something we've never had before. The system is designed to meet a variety of current user needs and it's very flexible and configurable so that when we determine new audiences we can cater for them as well. As it's in the cloud and the user base for Recollect is steadily growing, there's going to be continuous improvement that will benefit every organisation that has a Reflect licence. So that's a good thing. Um, there's also some very cool features like the online exhibitions uh, to bring in new audiences. And there's integration with Trove and the surfacing by Google, which will also help attract new audiences. So I hope you've enjoyed this brief walk through our exciting past, present and future community engagement initiatives. And I would love to come back next year and, uh, and show you the new archive management system live. <laughs>